Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about whether federalism is viable for Uganda. Well, my name is Odongato. I'm an advocate. I am an author. I'm a writer. I'm a historian. I'm a researcher and I'm a critical thinker. What is federalism? Federalism is derived from a Latin word, feudas, which means pact, treaty, or agreement. From a political science perspective, federalism is a system of government. There are several systems of government, of which federalism is one. So as political scientists, when we are talking of systems of government, you have to count all this. Unitary, federal, decentralization, devolution, deconcentration, decongestion, decongestion constitutional monarchy, monarchism. So federalism is a type of government where the separate units within a country is arranged into federal, federal units. The powers are divided at the metropole. The, the powers are not kept at the center. We have examples of federal around uh, the world. United States, Mexico, Germany, Brazil. In Africa, we have federalism in Nigeria, in Ethiopia. Let me first explain briefly the various types of government. Under devolution, the power is devolved from the center to the local units. And if you look at Kenya, they have gone for complete devolution after the terrible elections. So you'll find that uh, in Kisumu, they have uh, universities, airports, they control their local revenues, and they do their own things, their own way. So uh, that is a devolved system. Under the congestion, the government can decide that let's have Ministry of Finance in Karamoja, Ministry of Lands in Guru, Ministry of Water and Environment in Mbarara. They try to decongest the center. That is the con decongestion, which is also uh, a little bit akin and similar to deconcentration, deconcentration, concentrating powers to the center, to, to, to the metropole. For your information, federalism existed in Uganda before independence. When the Imperial British East African Company came and signed a pact with Buganda, and later the British government, they signed the 1900 agreement. That agreement was very clear that Buganda would operate a federal status. At the eve of independence, when the first shot was fired by Ghana at getting their independence in 1957, the colonial administration then realized there was a problem in Uganda because by the time the Imperial British East African Company and the, the, the 1900 agreement was signed, Buganda was a fully established state with its military, with its judiciary and everything. Actually, if you read the diaries of uh, Henry Morton Stanley, who visited Buganda in 1875. Henry Morton Stanley visited Uganda in 1875, and this is what he said from his diary. Uganda had troops, and they counted 125,000 troops, marching off a single campaign to the east. And in Lake Victoria, they had a fleet of over 230 war canoes, which was waiting to act as an auxiliary support. So by 1875, when Henry Morton uh, Stanley, whom they claim discovered Lake Victoria, I wonder how he discovered when there were people living there, they should only say he published it to the international media, came to Buganda, they found that Buganda was already an established kingdom. So Buganda was established there. So when the cry for independence came, the British said, wait a minute, we have a situation. We have an established government here, what are we going to do for Uganda? We cannot give independence. So the British commissioned two reports. One was called the Monster Commission. The Earl of Monster. The report is called the Monster Commission. You guys, you can go and read. They were to find out how best to resolve the land issues and the hegemonic status of Uganda before giving independence. The Monster Commission published its report. And this is a very interesting report. I would prefer to read it verbatim. 
the report recommended a federal position for Buganda because she was she has virtually reached that position already. And a federal position for the three kingdoms of Bunyoro, Ankole, and Toro. The three kingdoms would have substantial elements of federalism for their own internal process. But in relation to the central government, they would be roughly in the same position as other districts of Uganda and not part of the kingdom. The commission recommended the codification of customary law into Uganda, end quote. The Monster Commission, this is the recommendation of the Monster uh, Commission report of the 15th December 1960. They recommended federalism because they said there is no way they can do away with the hegemonic and organizational levels of Baganda that was leading and the semi quasi organizational levels of Ankole of Toro vis-a-vis -vis the different models in the other parts of the country. Mr. Obote then was pushing for independence. Then they commissioned a second report. The Com Constitutional Committee was established by Sir Edward Crawford, the then governor of Uganda and the then protectorate of Uganda, whereas Uganda was preparing for independence from Great Britain. The report, the report noted that the country had a wide range of tribes. But take note of this. Before the Wilde Commission report was issued, the Wilde Commission report was never, the final version was never published. If you check online, they, 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 they published a preliminary report because they could not conclude its finding. Because Buganda had given an ultimatum for Uganda to leave Buganda. So the, the second report, the Wilde Commission report, it's not very clear on the file. So there were two reports, the Earl of Monster report and John Wilde report, which was saying there is a problem in relation to the status of Buganda. We need to do something about it. So when Buganda issued an ultimatum to Uganda to leave, there are some Buganda nationalists, get it from me, there are some people in Buganda who are Buganda, who don't want federal, they are nationalists. One of them was the late Sebana Kizito. Sebana Kizito, when they issued an ultimatum that Uganda should leave Buganda, ask them a question, you people, are you sure of what you're doing? Are you ready to start importing electricity from Busoga Kingdom? Are you ready for that? So the struggle for federalism for Buganda has almost been a lifetime, a lifetime struggle. Let me go to the current situation. Is federalism tenable in Uganda? We need to answer these questions. Supposing Buganda wants federalism and the rest of the country does not want federalism. And remember, in the Odoki Commission report, these were the statistics in an attempt to answer the question I posed. 65% of all the people of Uganda wanted federalism. 97% of the people in Buganda wanted federalism. Who will Buganda federate with? Because traditionally, there were about 11, 12, 13, 14 federal states. West Nile, Acholi, Ankole, Teso, Toro, Bukedi. So, these are the presupposed federal units that should federate, that should come together and form Uganda. So, what happens, for example, if Karamoja does not want federalism and Buganda wants it? Because the demand for, for, for federalism in Buganda is unquestionable. They need it. So what happens? Now, this question would be answered. Even if we go to Gulu, Acholi as a federal state, supposing Acholi accepts federalism, but a pocket of, uh, of Acholi in Pade or Lamor does not want federalism. What happens? Because the constitution under Article 1 is very clear that power belongs to the people. You need to answer that question. What happens? Of course, from a political science perspective, there is always a solution. For example, Buganda wants federalism. In India, I was in India. I traveled from Delhi to Chandiga. It has a, a, a two-model system. Chandiga is a union. It is under the unitary system. Then the rest of India is, is, is under the federal system. So can we, in the interest of accommodating Buganda, 
can we accept that we have a two-pronged system where we have a federal system for those who want or majorly in Buganda or and then the rest of the country we have a unitary system can that be accommodated these are questions that we all have to engage in critical thinking the second question as a political scientist can federalism be distinguished from monarchism we have monarchies we have constitutional monarchs like in london you know how the queen relates the queen of england relates to the, the the prime minister we have several constitutional monarchs in the world now can federalism can the demand for federalism be distinguished can it be delineated from monarchism now this is the million dollar question because under the previous federal arrangement in uganda the Baganda, the kind of federal they need, is the one where the Kabaka is the king and they have their parliament, Luchicho. And yet our constitution says cultural leaders should not be involved in politics. That one can be amended. So the, because it is up to Baganda's right, if they want to be led by the Kabaka, that is them. They were like that before Uganda came. So can federalism be delinked from monarchism now if that question is answered another question has to be answered if the answer is to the affirmative if the answer is to the affirmative then the issue of land comes because the land in buganda belongs to the kabaka the land belongs to the monarchy Ugandans, since President Museveni came to power, have built millions of houses in Buganda. The land belongs to Buganda Kingdom. So, if federalism cannot be separated from monarchism, then that means the issue of the land will come at the center stage. So if you have a federal government and all the land belongs to the Kabaka, how will this be taken by other Ugandans who are settling uh, within Buganda? I saw the report of the Buganda Kingdom to the Constitutional Review uh, Commission. They said Buganda has been very tolerative. They have accommodated so many tribes. They said as of now, 40% of the land titles issued by Buganda Kingdom is, is to non-Buganda. So they are trying to say the issue of land rights will not arise. They even went further to say Buganda Kingdom offers scholarship and 25% of those scholarships are going to non-Buganda. So they are saying for them as a tribe, they are very accommodative. Yes. What happens if the federal kingdom of Buganda does not renew my lease in 49 years? What happens? Because this is a federal government. At least people feel they can lean on a unitary government where the government stops forceful eviction. What happened? Are you aware that at one point, the Bad Valley, the Bad Valley Primary School, the kingdom had refused to renew the title when the lease expired. Even those flats opposite Makere University. So, can the land, if we cannot distinguish federalism from monarchism, can we distinguish land rights from the monarchy? Now, this is the million dollar question. There was a proposal that Kampala be removed from Uganda so that the rest of it can remain to the kingdom, but Kampala remains to the central government. It sounds a good proposal, but the issue is, why would you remove the land of a cultural leader? It is their land. Why? Are you buying it? You're doing what? It is their land. So if you remove Kampala from Buganda, where would Buganda be? There has been debates that we get land and, make, and give it to the central government so that it is the central government to give titles to people. This would also amount to violation of cultural rights. For your information, let's go back to history. It is recorded in modern history that 
the Bantu migrated into Uganda around the 15th century. The first people recorded in modern history to migrate here were the Baganda, part of the Bantu in the 15th century. The early settlement pattern. But, listen to this, the first organized kingdoms in the area of Uganda, it was not then Uganda, where first in history were the Batwezi, who expanded extensively. The second were the Bito, who are the Nairotics. The Bito came, influenced greatly, they were great fighters, they influenced greatly Bunyoro, and they pushed the Batwezi up to Karagwe and parts of Tanzania. That is how the Chwezi and subsequently the Bahima are settled in, in Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda, to the southern part. Then to the northerly part was Bunyoro. That remained because of the influence of Bito, the Pabet. And then subsequently, the Buganda kingdom. But there were already people here in Buganda by the 15th century, but they were not yet politically organized. So for strategic reasons, the Baganda, when they saw the activities of the Pabito, the fighting, the warrior nature, they resorted to engage in assimilation as opposed to military expansion. This was very intelligent of them. So at the end of the day, they assimilated and they expanded by assimilation. So by the beginning of the 17th century, the most organized political entity in the whole of Uganda was Buganda. Because the issue of removing Kampala from Buganda or the issue of removing the land rights from Kabaka and giving it to the central government would amount to a violation of the cultural rights of people who were here before there was Uganda. When the monster released the report that Uganda was not ready for independence, they sent another report, the Wilde Commission report, the Buganda, Buganda asked Uganda to leave Buganda. The second report was not released. Obote was approached by the colonial administrators. And they requested that the future of Uganda is going to be a problem. Give us two years. Give us two years and we shift the capital city to the geographical center of Uganda. That is Masindi Point. Because they detected that you cannot establish a country within an established kingdom. Actually, Buganda was a country the size of Rwanda and Burundi. History has really been very unfair to them. Up to today, when you see some of them running around, they want leadership. It's, all, it's a product of history. It is a result. They requested for two years extension. So they requested two years. So that independence of Uganda would be granted in 1964. And they shift the capital city to Masindi Port. It is 150 kilometers from every part of Uganda. If you can cross the Nile to Gulu, here, ever. And at that time, Obote, at that time, Obote resisted. That it was a trick by the colonial administration to delay independence. Ghana has already got there. We cannot wait any longer. The wave of Pan-Africanism was huge. People have got theirs. The Kanu, Mao Mao, Maji Maji, everywhere in Africa, the language was independent. So you need another two years now. So Ugandan independence was given in a hurry. And that is why we are here where we are. Now, if it's a cultural genocide, I'm using that word, to remove land from the Kapaka and give it to the central government, if it is a grave cultural violation, to, 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 to let Kampala and parts of Wakiso be part of the central government because it is a violation to the rights of these people. Can it be an option to shift the capital city to Masindi Port? Can it be an option? Okay, let's talk about this. Let's look at Tanzania. Tanzania in 1973, the socialist Nyerere, whom I love so much, I like his philosophy, created the Jama villages and made declarations that the capital city of Tanzania shall be in Dodoma. I was in Dodoma. It's fair to pick up. 40 years down the road, they hired Canadian architects, American architects. They took the Maoist model of the city. Dodoma today 
is a shadow of his own self. Even ginger is bigger than Dodoma. Can it work? Let's go to Nigeria. The same time, 1977, I think, 1977, the capital city was moved from Lagos, from Lagos to Abuja. Has Abuja taken over Lagos? Is it working? Would it work in Uganda? Let's go to Ghana. Ghana, they even decreed that the capital city would go to, to Tema. They call it Harbour Port in Ghana. I was checking the statistics. In 2006, there were 201,000 people in Tema going to the new capital city. But in 2013, the population declined to 197,000. People are moving back to Accra. So can it work? In Sudan, when they got uh, their independence, they said they should move the capital city from Juba to Ramishet. Will it work? So, would moving the capital city from Uganda to Masindi Port, can it help diffuse the land tension so that if Buganda wants federalism, they can be given their federalism? That may not even be a very intelligent question because if the capital city is moved, what about the people who build their infrastructures? People who build houses in Buganda. What happened? Can those houses be carried? What happens? Because the biggest challenge I have been to Kiseka Market, I've been to the lowest ends of people who are not properly educated. Some of them think federal is the day other people will leave Buganda and they start owning all those properties. Some of them think that way. And yet, the report of Buganda Kingdom to the Constitutional to Doki Commission was very clear that Buganda would protect the rights of those who have migrated here. So there, is, there are wrong signals going to the public. So what happens under a federal? Under a federal system, the federal government will control all the revenue it collects. They can control depending on the pact, depending on the feudals, depending on the agreement. They can say the federal government takes 90% and the central government takes 10%. I've been to Nigeria, I went to Calabar, and then I flew to Apaibom. Man! Apaibom is more developed than South Africa. Please Google Apaibom. Because the federal government used the oil revenues got from their area to develop their area and then a little bit of the money they give to the central government. Even the youth who are fighting there, who are beginning the Biafran revolution in the 60s, are slightly turned down because they can see massive development using their revenue. So the argument of many people, why would you collect money from here and use it to develop other regions? Betty Kamiya the current IGG wrote a very good article some five years back. She said 76% of all the government revenue is collected from Buganda. And then you take it to develop other areas, Gulu, Arua, Mbarara. Is it fair? So the apologies, the architects of, of federal are saying, the revenue collected from here should be used to develop here. The gold being mined from Karamoja should be used to develop Karamoja. I think the sectarian nature of the NRM government should not force us to give wrong prescriptions. There is sectarianism in government. 76% of the money is collected from Uganda. Out of that, in the financial year 2019-2020, 51% of all the tarmac roads was done in Western Uganda. So you collect money from here and you go and develop there. And the people here... They keep being like that. Who is the biggest gold exporter in Uganda? This got from Karamoja. Who? It's the same people. So the sectarian and biased nature of government, very frustrating, makes now people start saying, we need federal to do our own things. Is it the right prescription? You need to read that article by Betty Kamehameha. So under a federal system, each federal unit would generate its own revenue and do what they want. According to the pact, they can run education, health, roads, everything, name it. 
What does the central government do? The central government can do international relations, defense and security. They go and attend the United Nations uh, General Assembly. They help in case of things like pandemic. So the national government is made weaker and the federal government is made stronger. But currently in Uganda, the national government collects revenue from the local units and they spend close to 80% of that money and only 25% is transferred to the local government. If the decentralization system in Uganda was working, we would probably have more money, 80%, going to the, to the districts and then 20% remaining with the central government. So the prescription for the failures of decentralization, for the failure to run a fair and equitable government, the prescription may not necessarily have to be federal. How can we make the call for federalism not be a lifetime struggle? The constitution of Uganda is very clear. Under Article 1, it says power belongs to the people. Under Article 5, it states Uganda shall be a sovereign state and a republic. It's in the constitution. Uganda shall be a republic. What's a republic? A republic is a system, it's, it's a unit that is run in the people's interest. This is from the uh, Latin word res publica. Things done according to the interest of the people. And who are the people? The people are the people. Who are the people in Uganda? The people, the word people must be interpreted con con conjunctively. The people of Uganda, the people of Guru, the people of Tesla, the people of Toro. Those are the people. So if the republic is for the people and power belongs to the people, how can Uganda get federalism? Or how can federalism come in Uganda? What happens if other people don't want federalism? So the constitution is very clear. For federalism to come to Uganda, to Uganda it has to pass through parliament. Under Article 259 of the Constitution, to, to, to state that Uganda shall not be a republic, it can be amended by Parliament. And then maybe they add Uganda shall be a federal republic. Now let's look at the Parliament. This is the Parliament that is to pass the law. There is no other way Uganda can, can get federalism without Parliament. The only exit route is through the Parliament. How many MPs from the central are in Parliament? 120. For, fed, for Uganda to change from a unitary state, from a republic to a federal state, there has to be two thirds of the votes in Parliament. Two thirds. The two thirds, two thirds of all members of Parliament. Two thirds. So we have 540 members of parliament. So two-thirds of them should accept that, yes, we need federal. So is it possible to get those numbers? It's possible. Nothing is impossible. So my free political advice is that those advocating for federalism should first of all campaign for the whole of Uganda to accept it. Federalism should not be seen as a Buganda thing. The moment the whole of Uganda accepts it, that two-thirds majority will not be a problem. The second issue, land rights. What happens to the land rights of people? In other federal governments, it is the city council issuing leases. It's not the monarchy. In Gulu city, in Mbale city, you get a lease from the central, from the local government, from Gulu district local government, not from the road of Acholi. The lease is issued by the municipal authorities. But strangely in Kampala, the lease has to be issued by Bolange. So these are some of the problems we have to live with for a lifetime. So can the issue of land be resolved? Can the issue of monarchism and federalism be delinked? If these issues are, di are disposed, then we can start thinking of how to give people what they want. Nationalism has become a word of the dictionary. Certain ethnic groups are profiteering and benefiting from the government more than other ethnic groups. We know these things. 
So because of the unfairness and the injustice, many people are saying, we have to go federal so that Ankole can go back to Ankole. Acholi can go back to Acholi and do their affairs. And Buganda collects their, their revenue. I've exposed, I've adumbrated the challenges that will come, that the issues that need to be addressed. Now, if we say Ankole goes back to Ankole, would the federal system in Ankole be under the Mugabe? You know the people who don't want the Mugabe establishment. Can we have a federal system in Acholi running without it being under the what? So these are issues. What is the prescription? If someone has malaria, do you prescribe Panadol? Do you prescribe Flagyl? The fact remains, we know, we all have, mal we know the patient has malaria. Uganda is sick of the malaria, of tribalism, of ethnic hegemony. But do we, pre do we give a wrong prescription? We all know malaria is bad. We also know mosquitoes spread malaria. But should we shoot the mosquito with an atomic bomb? Should we shoot one mosquito with an atomic bomb? That is the question for another day. Even some federal units are very poor. They are very poor. What would West Nile sell to survive? What would Acholi sell to survive other than rice? What would Busoga have to offer for Uganda other than electricity? The sugarcane plantations are private. What would Ankole offer to Uganda? Matoka and milk and beef. What would Toro offer to Uganda? Because now you have to think political economics. What are you going to sell? What are you going to tax? Where are you going to tax the revenue from? So there are times we ask for administrative units without thinking of the economics of where the money would come from. So there has to be, what's the way forward? There has to be an open dialogue on the best way forward for Uganda. There has to be an open dialogue. The debate has to be to continue. I have just provoked and influenced thoughts. Please subscribe and uh, you'll wait for my next release. Subscribe. Thank you for watching. That's so kind of you.